worst place in the world to be a woman. Rape capital of the world. These are the labels most often used to describe the Democratic Republic of the Congo. What most people don't know is that literally hundreds of thousands of women and girls have been raped in that country since 1998. In fact, approximately six million people have died due to the fighting between armed groups in Eastern DRC. This is the largest death toll since World War II in any conflict. And yet most people are not aware of this humanitarian crisis. Let me stop for a second before I go any further to say that sexualized violence is a difficult topic to talk about. So I always give credit to my audiences for their willingness to listen and to engage. So thank you for being here. As a scholar activist, I face many dilemmas when trying to raise awareness about what's happening in Congo. For example, I must impress upon you the level of atrocities, but not overwhelm you with de horrific details of stories about sexual assault or perpetuate stereotypes about Congo as if it's some awful, dark place where every man is a rapist and every woman is a victim because it's not true. My challenge as a scholar activist is to try and communicate to you the complexities of what's going on in Congo, why, and what needs to change. In fact, my goal today is to inspire you to take action by sharing with you the incredible strength, courage, and resilience of so many women and girls that I've met who have suffered so much, but yet have hope. And I need to do all of this in 16 minutes. So let's get started. First thing you need to know about why rape is happening on such a massive scale in Congo is that this country is a failed state. It is the size of Western Europe. It has poor governance, no infrastructure, and an inability to protect its citizens. One of the most commonly recognized uh, sources for the conflict in Congo is what's happening over its natural resources. Many of you are probably familiar with blood diamonds. There's something similar happening in Congo around what's known as conflict minerals, specifically coltan. All of our electronic devices, your cell phone, your laptop, your digital camera, your Xbox, all require coltan and some combination of these conflict minerals in order for it to function. This is precisely what connects all of us to this crisis in Eastern DRC. So here's what happens. Congo has some of the largest deposits in the world of coltan and these other conflict minerals. Congo's a failed state. So you have all of these foreign forces, these rebel militias who have taken over the mineral mines in the eastern part of the country. They use slave labor to extract the minerals. Those minerals then end up in the black market, transported out via neighboring countries who are also benefiting from this illegal trade. And eventually, that coltan ends up in the cell phone that you purchase at the big box store in the strip mall. In other words, the world's consumption, our consumption of electronic devices is fueling the crisis in Eastern Congo. Now, that said, it's too simplistic to say that cell phones equal rape. That is a common soundbite that's often used by advocacy organizations, but it's much more complex than that. When it comes to rape and violence in Congo, there is rampant impunity for these crimes. The people in Congo and in neighboring countries who are benefiting from the illegal trade of minerals are also 
supplying the weapons and funding these foreign forces and these armed groups who have taken over the mines and are wreaking all of the havoc. But you can't understand any of what's happening in Congo unless you put it into historical context and consider the devastating legacies of King Leopold of Belgium, of colonization, of the 30-year reign of Mobutu. But why is rape happening on such a massive scale at unprecedented historical levels? Rape as a tactic has been used since the beginning of time to demoralize and dominate a people. Women's bodies are often regarded as a spoil of war. When you destroy a woman's body, you shred the very fabric of society. That leads me to the next dilemma that I face often in trying to raise awareness. What's wrong with this catchphrase? It's provocative. It gets your attention. I understand why it gets used over and over again. I need some way to try to get you to care about a people you will probably never meet who live halfway around the world. So I get it. But it's labels like this that so over, grossly oversimplify what is, in fact, a very complex situation. We must remember that men are also the targets of sexualized violence. This phrase leaves no room for all that is beautiful and functional and healthy in Congolese society and in culture. Women are not victims, they're survivors. And they are more than the sum total of their attacks. They are aunties and high school students and farmers and shopkeepers and members of their church choirs. This actually leads me to the next dilemma. As an activist, I want to use all of my photographs to try and raise awareness about what's happening in Congo. Those images can be very powerful. But what people don't understand is that we have to protect the identities of the women when they come forward, share their stories, and then implicate the armed groups who have perpetrated the violence. We have to be very careful. It's not likely that an armed group might pull a woman's image off of the internet, hunt her down in some sort of to seek revenge because she outed them as the perpetrators, but it is a risk that is just too great for us to take. A place of refuge for the women who have survived sexual assault is Pansy Hospital. There, Dr. Dennis McQuaige and his colleagues save lives, restore dignity, and provide hope for women who have suffered from just horrific attacks. On average, they treat about 1,200 women a year who come uh, because of injuries due to rape. They range in age from toddlers as young as two to women in their 80s. No one is spared. You need to also understand that there is a heavy stigma that is associated with rape. And this happens in Congo, it happens in other countries as well, where a woman who has been sexually assaulted is considered damaged goods, dirty and unworthy. She's often abandoned by her husband, by her family, by her village. And she's often blamed for her assault. It's with these women that I work at Pansy Hospital and who participate in my research. I founded a uh, nonprofit in the U.S. with Dr. McQuaige. Uh, we needed a foundation to support the work of his hospital in Eastern DRC. Because of that, I'm able to visit the region often. I feel very fortunate for that. And in fact, I just returned from three months in Congo at the hospital. While I was there, I was able to interview women about their acceptance or rejection of children born from rape. Can you even imagine? 
What I'd like to do next is to share with you the story of an amazing teenager that I call Mateso. I noticed Mateso immediately at Pansy Hospital because she was so much younger than the rest of the women there. Obviously, something terrible had brought her to Pansy, but that's what was so remarkable because she moved about hospital grounds, shoulders back, head up, a confidence that totally belied any sort of trauma. For interviews that I uh, conducted with women on another research project about the stigma associated with rape, I spoke with women one at a time uh, under a tree on hospital grounds. The day we began the interviews, the first to arrive was Mateso. Now, I knew we couldn't interview her because she wasn't 18 and I had no way of getting informed consent from her parents. So through my translator, Roger, we chatted with uh, Mateso and explained the policy uh, to her, thanked her very much for coming, had a lovely conversation, and we sent her on her way, and she was fine with that. Second day, we start interviewing, and who's the first to arrive? It's Mateso. Here she comes, all smiles and chatty. I was a little surprised. I teased her about whether she had aged two years remarkably overnight. She didn't look any taller or any older. She laughed, and we explained the policy once again that you had to be 18, and uh, she understood, no problem. So we chatted, we sent her on her way. Third day in a row, guess who's back? Here comes Mateso. Roger, the translator, said, looked at me and said, Leanne, don't worry, I'll handle it. I'll send her away. I said, no, no, no. Obviously, this young lady has something very important to say, and we are not going to deny her that. So we shut off the audio recorder, we turned off the video camera, we sat, and we listened. This is the story that Mateso shared with us. She was 13 years old at the time, and she was walking to the market to sell cassava when she was ambushed by the FDLR, kidnapped, and taken into the woods where she was held as a slave for one year. She was raped repeatedly, became pregnant. Due to complications around labor and delivery, the soldiers used a knife to make the birth easier. The baby was stillborn. Matesa was locked in a room for days, during which time she was forced to drink the urine of the soldiers, flies began to swarm around her injuries, she was so severely wounded, the soldiers never expected that she might try to escape. But she found the strength to flee, walking for three nights, hiding during the day. Eventually, she found help, and she was brought to Pansy Hospital. When I met Mateso, she was 16, having been at Pansy Hospital for two years. She suffered from an obstetric fistula, and despite multiple surgeries, she continued to leak urine. But she stayed on at Pansy with the hope that the next surgery would be successful and that she would one day be able to return to her village. Well, Roger and I sat there dumbfounded. We were completely overwhelmed by what she had just shared with us. She was so young. I don't know what you were doing at 13 years of age, but my life was certainly nothing compared to that. Roger and I praised Mateso endlessly, telling her you know, how clever she was to have escaped and how strong she was to have survived. And then I asked her, I said, Mateso, you came back three days in a row to talk to us. Why? Why was it so important for you to tell us that story? And she said, I tell you this story because so many people don't know. I want you to tell others. Now you know why I'm here. And now all of you can serve as witness, as messenger, and as advocate. What's happening in Congo is horrific. But there are many humanitarian crises around the world, and we certainly have a lot of problems right here in the U.S. So why should you care? Raphael Lemkin 
was a Polish lawyer who coined the term genocide in 1944. Prior to this, there was no language to describe the intentional destruction of a group of people because of their ethnicity or their religion. He once said, and I'm paraphrasing, if you knew that women, children, and old people were going to be murdered a hundred miles from here, wouldn't you run to help? Then what stops this decision of your heart when the distance is 3,000 miles instead of 100? I don't see boundaries. They are arbitrary. People often say to me, and, and often quite critically, why are you doing all this work in Africa? We have so many problems right here at home. Well, where exactly is home? Should I only help people within my town limits, within my county? within Pennsylvania, the US, who is my neighbor? To me, it's not an either-or dilemma, it's a both-and. I try to make a difference in Africa and in my own backyard. You can bet that Mateso doesn't see borders. And I would like to think that if I had a problem, or if this nation were in crisis, that other countries would not see borders either. I'm going to leave you with one final image. It is the favorite of all of my photographs of Congo because I think it so totally captures human resilience. But I can't show it to you because it reveals the faces of the women. So I'm going to describe it to you instead. Imagine, if you will, three young women, 18 years old, They've never met each other until coming to Pansy Hospital. They're standing side by side, laughing hysterically, arms around each other's shoulders, carrying on like normal teenagers. If you look more closely at the photograph, you'll see that all three of them are pregnant. Unfortunately, it's due to rape. In fact, the two on the right are about a week away from delivery. Can you imagine? 18 years old, and about to give birth to a baby out of such horrific circumstances. But yet they're able to form friendships, to laugh, to carry on with each other. Many of the women that I've met who are in similar circumstances actually go on to give their babies names like luck and joy and innocence. I hope that you will leave with the women of Congo on your conscience today. Remember the incredible courage and strength of Mateso and the other women and girls in Congo. Let Mateso's story tap the best in you. Even if you tell one person today what you've learned about this, you have dared to make a difference for Congo. Now, that's an idea worth spreading. Thank you. Thank you.